All right, we're ready to get started, guys. Um, so welcome to our annual review of regula regulations and universal precautions training. Um, we will try to get through this in an hour so that we can wrap up by 6.30. So just a lot of review. Um, just raise your hand, answer if you think you know the answer, answer if you think you don't know the answer but you'd like to try. Um, Wendy will keep score. The winner will receive a Graf Dairy gift card. So here we go. We'll start with uh, universal precautions, um, now called standard precautions. Um, who thinks they can summarize what univer universal precautions or standard precautions are? What does that mean? Like fire, physical safety, universal precautions would be something that anybody in any kind of scenario like working or public space would be expected to have given to them, so I'm just guessing. So something kind of like structural building and sanitary conditions. Um, close. You're on the right track with the sanitary conditions one. Um, so it has to do with um, like exposure to something. To the universe. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's universal. Um, yes. Universal precautions. <laughs> Wendy, do you want to answer? Uh, bodily fluids. Protecting yourself from bodily fluids. Oh. Yes. That's so. Easy. Just a little narrower than you were talking about, Teresa. So, so universal precautions. Teresa, the point. <laughs> um, oh, well, I will let you. I will you let you make it. the judgment on oh, that no, scorekeeper. You get it when you win. Creativity. There's so, a universal precautions is the practice of avoiding contact with bodily fluids by means of the wearing of non-porous articles such as gloves, goggles, and face shields to protect from bloodborne pathogens and diseases transmitted through blood or body fluids. Um, who can give me three bloodborne diseases that you can think of? Hep C, AIDS, Hep B. Yeah, got them. We'll give her the point for that. You guys have to be faster than I am. <laughs> this is like my prime time of the day. Oh, okay. Now. I'm not a morning person. <laughs> Everybody be warned. All right, how do you protect yourself from, um, bodily fluids and bloodborne diseases. Washing your hands, showering, and gloves. Yes. Um, let's give uh, Lindsay two points for that. Uh, washing hands and wearing gloves, protective barriers are two things on the list. Um, other things, can you think of anything else for protecting against bloodborne diseases? Um, face mask would count in the protective barriers, I think, so if we can give Elena a point for that. Um, other things are cleaning contaminated areas mm -hmm. and appropriate disposal of contaminated waste. So, um, what is the proper use of gloves? Before you touch anything that is not your own body or that has been contaminated by someone else's body parts, put them on and then don't take them off until after you're done touching everything and then you have to take them off carefully. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, wash hands before and after use. Do not reuse the gloves and then remove gloves prior to, or like put on the gloves before exactly what you said, before touching the contaminated surface and re remove after you're done with that. Um, what is the proper, proper removal of gloves and who would like to demonstrate? Oh, I'm going to give it to Brand this time. <laughs> It's just putting on and taking off gloves. Yes. Yeah, yes. Without so like right way. So when I without touching point, anything. I said the proper use is the balloon volleyball. <laughs> <laughs> no, that Are you kidding me? That's ten points. Very yeah, yeah. <laughs> Good job. Mm -hmm. oh, yes. <laughs> what you got for that? <laughs> Yes. Yeah. Catapults into the trash can, yes. <laughs> All right, so we'll give Brandt a point for that one. Thank you. <laughs> can I have those for house? <laughs> They're like that. I just bought two boxes for the house because we were out. So one will go under the sink and one will go in the corner of the kitchen underneath the whiteboard for anyone's knowledge and use. Um, we also have a couple of pairs in the first aid kit. 
All right, who can describe proper hand washing? Um, I can. All right, Lindsay. It's all right. <laughs> <laughs> um, first, wet your hands with warm water. Second, get soap. Third, two pumps of soap. Third, <laughs> lather for five to 10, nope, five to 20 seconds. 20 seconds is as long as a happy birthday song. That is what you should do. Then you rinse with hot water and drip dry for a second and then get your towel, hopefully automatic towel, and then dry for at least five seconds. Wow. wow. Stellar job. Did you yes. think that was because of civil rights? Yes. I just took it. I don't know. That was awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Very interesting. Yes. That was exactly right. Okay. <laughs> what, what type of situation should be treated as a potential risk? This is sort of a trick question. <laughs> yeah. What type of situation should be treated as a potential risk? All situations. Yes. <laughs> yep. Treat every situation as a potential risk and each individual as though he or she has an infectious disease. So, can't be too careful, I guess. Um, all right, that's our quick overview of universal precautions. You know where the gloves are, you know how to wash your hands. Good to go. So, now we will move on to regulations of the homeless youth shelter. So, we are a licensed youth shelter by the state of Colorado and so we are required to follow certain protocol. Um, so we have some regulations, we have like a little booklet of regulations that we have to follow and so this is the review of you know the ones most important for you to know. Um, so within 24 hours of arrival at the shelter a youth shall be given, oh also the, the wording I took directly from the book so it's gonna sound you know sort of like blah, you know, a lot of shall and that kind of thing. A youth shall be given an orientation to the shelter consistent with the youth's age and ability to participate, which includes at least the following four items. So I'll give one point for each item that you could list. So we could have four people or if one person wants to try to name them all. So four, four things. Mm -hmm. Following four items. Yeah. The rules of the house. Yep, that's one. Emergency contact. Uh, fire escape, uh, like where to get their food and when the food's being served, where they're supposed to be sleeping. I only got one so far. <laughs> you've gotten, oh, you've gotten two. Um, um, where they're you might supposed have to go to three. school. Might have what other things? Where the fire extinguisher is. Where the what? Fire extinguisher? I said fire extinguisher. Yeah, she covered fire. So we've got, um, it sounded like two of four. You might have gotten three that I missed. Um, so one is tour of the shelter and instruction on fire alarm and fire evacuation procedures, escape routes and exits. Two is the rules and regulations of the shelter. Three is procedures affecting the youth's behavior, including limiting or restricting a youth's rights where allowed, oh. the type of discipline used in the shelter and consequences for certain behaviors. Um, and four is the, the complete youth's rights and youth's grievance procedures as developed by the shelter or by the certifying authority. Um, that number four, we generally, in fact, all of these we go over in the first part of the intake. So these are things that have to be done within 24 hours of their arrival. So um, next, the shelter shall have written policies and procedures that address and ensure the availability of each of the following core rights for youth and residents. These rights may not be restricted or denied by the shelter. So there's a list of 10 rights. Um, we read these to the youth at their intake. It's on one of the pages that they sign. It's on one of the pages in the, the binder on the main level for easy reference. So. 10, you know, 10 possible points here. We can popcorn around the room, like whatever you can think of. Uh, right to a reasonable degree of privacy. Yep, you quoted right, it word for word. Right That's one. to um, the freedom of religious and ethnic practice. Somebody um, here has done an intake before. <laughs> That's two. Freedom of speech. I should know more than that. <laughs> um, <laughs> Is grievance a right? 
Um, yes, that, I believe, is on here somewhere. So I'll give you that one. Yep. The right to file a grievance. Some kind of like judicious uh, hearing out if there is a problem like within the house. That's a grievance. That's a grievance. Okay. Um, right to food. Um, yes, the right to. I'll, I should read these as you say them so that we can cross them off here. So, uh, Brand got um, number one, the right to enjoy freedom of thought, conscience, cultural and ethnic practice and religion. And number two, every youth has the right, right to a reasonable degree of privacy. Um, I think I'll probably find that grievance was one as I'm going through here. Um, where? The right to... Oh yes, number seven. Somebody got number seven. Um, the right to receive adequate and appropriate food, clothing, and housing. Uh, oh, okay. I think say something like re reasonable safety, but that might be housing. Um, yes. So that's number eight. Every youth has the right to live in clean, safe surroundings. Right to medical care. Yes, the right ah. to ad the adequate, appropriate, and timely emergency medical care. And right to education. Yes, the right to. Um, participate in an educational program that will maximize his or her potential in accordance with existing law. Uh, uh, some kind of contact with general. family. <laughs> yes. The right to communicate with others outside the shelter, such as parent or guardian, caseworker, attorney or guardian ad litem, therapist, etc., etc., etc. Right to leave whenever they want to, like mm -hmm. dismissal from the program. That is oddly not on here. That must be just understood. Was the speech one not on there? Um, that goes under the n n number one, oh, freedom okay. of thought, cultural and ethnic there practice and religion. The last one had another eight, right? Sorry, to being able to leave. To leave. Um, well, they all they all have freedom to leave. Um, we d we can't restrict that, but um, we it depends on the parental situation of whether or not we alert the parent or guardian or not. But they all have the right to leave. Um, somebody might have said something along these lines. Every youth has the right to have his or her opinions heard and considered to the greatest extent possible when any decisions are made affecting his or her life. I heard something. I can't remember who it was. <laughs> All right. Um, <laughs> I don't remember saying that one, but. All right, we've got one. Oh, only one left, so I'll just read that one. Um, every youth has the right to be free from physical abuse or neglect and inhumane treatment. Every youth has the right to be protected from all form forms of sexual exploitation. Mm -hmm. So, Alright, the next one is the shelter shall have written policies and procedures regarding discipline that must be explained to all youth, parents, guardians, staff, and placing agencies. These policies must include positive responses to a youth's appropriate behavior. Um, so give me some examples of positive responses. Uh, I think we have four. <laughs> that is the one of the specific um, ways that the house uses it. So think a little more general. Oh, okay. Praise. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Praise for appropriate behavior is one. Um, uh, like um, more accessibility to go do like freedom. Privileges? Yeah, privileges. Um, yes, okay, so privileges would be one, yes. So giving privileges for appropriate behavior. What one did you say? Oh, uh, praising appropriate behavior. Praise, privileges. Yeah. Um, four other things. Use the point system. Yeah, I think we actually named the two that fall into this category here because it talks about um, discipline, like the discipline that we do use should be constructive or educational and can include talking with the youth about the situation, praise for appropriate behavior, diversion, so like, you know, um, getting them off the topic, uh, separation from the problem situation, and with withholding privileges. So there were kind of two things in there at the same time. All right, what... So fill in the blank. Shall not be denied as a disciplinary measure. Shelter. Food. 
Ooh. Um, I'm going to give you each a point because it's basic rights. So basic rights shall not be denied as a disciplinary measure. So who are we giving points to? Uh, Lori and Teresa. No, it was me. Oh, Lori and Maddie, sorry. Lori and Maddie. True or false, youth at the shelter may discipline other residents. False. False. <laughs> false. <laughs> That would be quite the circus. Yes. Wow. I think Brant said that first. Yeah. I think everyone should get a point for that one. <laughs> does, any, does anybody think differently? Just kidding. <laughs> <They'll> answer. <laughs> yeah. um, a shelter shall prohibit all cruel and unusual discipline, including but not limited to, to the following. They list 16 items here. So let's just name off some of them. Like um, most of them are pretty. Sexual exploitation. All right, let's see. Um, those were in the things that they had the freedom from, mm -hmm. um, withholding food, being called bad names. Okay, so withholding Shame. food is one, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Verbal abuse is another. Um, and then you said, the first one you said was neglect. close. Abuse. Neglect, yes. Um, ignoring them. Yes. So that would be withholding of emotional okay. response or stimulation. Uh, not That's allowing them neglect. to go see their parents or legal guardian. Not allowing them to go to... Those are all the basic things. <laughs> I don't know. Are they different than the basic thing? Um, you can't withhold the basic rights, so what are the right. other things that are included in there? Um. Let's see. So you hit on one sort of so any type of physical punishment at all so no physical punishment of any type any variety um, no discipline that's designed to or likely to cause physical pain a lot of these are physical actually um, other like physical exercises such as running laps oh. doing push-ups or carrying heavy rocks bricks idea. lumber or other heavy items when used solely as a means of punishment yeah so you can't make teens carry rocks because they're in trouble. Um, assignment of physically strenuous or harsh work that could result in harm to the youth. A lot of these seem sort of repetitive. Um, requiring or forcing a youth to take an uncomfortable position such as squatting or bending or requiring a youth to stay in a position for an extended length of time um, such standing as standing the with the nose to the wall, <laughs> yes, holding their hands over their head, so no military punishment. Um, let's see. Group discipline, except in accordance with the shelter's written policy and these rules. Um, I'm not exactly sure what constitutes as group punishment, but so we got verbal abuse. Um, we got denial of essential or basic program service solely for disciplinary measures. This does not, however, prohibit the shelter from requesting the youth to leave the shelter because of inappropriate behavior. So we do have to do that sometimes. Um, we got deprivation of food. Um, let's see. Is that a temporary? Um, or was what temporary? Permanent when you ask them to leave. Uh, it's usually not permanent. Okay. Yeah. We almost always allow them to cycle back through. Okay. Releasing noxious, toxic, or otherwise unpleasant sprays, mists, or aerosol substances in proximity Jeez. to the youth's face. Yeah, so it's like everything that the police and the military do. I was mm. just going to say, you've seen that show Beyonce. What is it, Beyond Third Strength? They do a lot of that stuff. Oh. Oh, yeah. yeah. But that's also not trauma informed. That's a big difference. Say no more. It's a big difference. Denial of sleep is another one. Um, isolating a youth in a locked room for discipline. Withholding, oh, you said that one already. Um, use of physical or mechanical restraint. Denial of basic needs of a youth that hasn't been requested to leave the shelter and requiring the youth to remain silent for a period of time inconsistent with the youth's age, developmental level, or medical condition. So those are the unacceptable forms of punishment. What is the requirement for CPR and first aid certification? Eight hours every year. Um, it's a physical, it's it's physical it's test, right? When you dump them after the dumping thing, mm -hmm. or am I just thinking the school district? Um, I'm thinking a little more general. So just like, what's our requirement for certification? Yeah, yeah, just pretty basic. So it, it was more general. Um, so we just have to have one person on site, one person on shift who's CPR first aid uh, certified at all times. Um, we can have 
more than one person on shift and one of them doesn't have to be CPR first aid certified, but one of them does. Um, and can where? I, can I ask you a question mm -hmm. along sure. that line? How long are the house, like can you, do you have the notes for like when ours expire? Oh, that's a good question. We should, but I think the standard is two years. Two years? Um, yeah. I could be wrong about that, but I think most no, certifications are two years. Okay. Yeah. Can you do trainings that are not eight hours during a weekday during work? Yes. Okay. In fact, our last training was like four hours, so. But, uh, I might have missed it then. Whatever it was, I can go because I have to work. Okay. Yeah, um, I'll try to make sure that our next one is in an evening, like yeah. after five Thanks. or something. Um, where is the house first aid kit? In the garage. Yes. Where in the garage? Right, we need to open the doors and right here on the right. Yes, okay. Um, who may administer medication and how should medication be stored? We have to get so two part certified question. and I don't know how. Oh, and then it has to get stored in the locked container. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, med uh, administration of medication shall be done only by a person licensed and authorized according to written policies of the shelter. For us that's QMAP. Um, and then all medication has to be kept in a clean storage area inaccessible to youth and stored according to pharmacy instructions. Um, how far in advance does the menu need to be planned? One month. One week. Yeah, actually. Um, I usually try to shoot for one month when we can, but the, the minimum requirement is one week in advance. Um, what foods must not be served to teens? This is also sort anything of a strangely worded question. To, and anything yeah. that's past doesn't have a date on it, and anything that's past the date. Um, yes. Close enough. You got the first one. So um, anything that they're allergic to or something that's known to cause a health hazard. Um, so I guess, you know, something that's not dated could count as a health hazard. Um, you, and also youth must not be given foods that are contrary to their religious beliefs or of their family or allergies. So we already said that. Um, how many fire extinguishers are required for the shelter? One on every floor. Actually, the, this standard says only one per the building, um, but it does say that um, this requirement may be waived where more extensive fire control measures are required by a local fire department. So I'm not sure if our local one requires three or if we just have three to be safe, but the, the minimum required by the state is one. I think she's right, but in this county. Okay. It's supposed to be on each floor. Okay, south. cool. Well, in that case, we have our fire extinguishers. <laughs> How many smoke detectors are required? One per room. Um, close, one per level. So same as the, the fire extinguisher yeah. thing. What is the rule about exit routes? Actually, there's two, two specific things that we want to know about what's important about exit routes. They have to be posted somewhere? Um, that is true, not on here, but I'll give you a point for that. Um, so we have fire escape like maps um, posted around the house. They have to be easy, um, like easily accessible and uh, yes. clear. Yep, easily accessible and clear um, and obvious. So no lock or fastening to prevent free escape. Um, and then no, the area should be free of discarded furniture, furnishings, laundry, and stacks of newspaper or magazines that could interfere with the prompt evacuation of the shelter. So, um, where the trash goes on top of yes, the thing downstairs. Yes. So um, who can name where the trash always gets piled up on top of and near the downstairs basement bedroom? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Who can name the six um, fire escapes at the house, otherwise known as doors or big windows? Three from the stairs, the front door, the back door. Uh, the other three. Yeah, because yeah. of the other room. Two break out basement windows. Yeah. yeah three, actually. Three stairs, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. How many more there? Front door, back door, six. garage door. Garage. Garage? Um, no, actually, no. The, there's one in the TV room. So those, oh, those doors yeah, are, yeah, yeah that's right. The yeah. garage door isn't considered? 
Um, no, because it's not, you can't get out of it quick enough. It's oh, like and it's, it's locked. Because if the you electricity goes out, then, oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Yep. Well, and plus you have to you have to yeah, unlock yeah. it where all of the other exits you don't have to unlock yeah. in order to get out of them. There's none up upstairs. Um no. no? You gotta go on trampoline and can jump. I know. No. <laughs> um also uh make sure it's important that fire escape routes like particularly those uh grates as Teresa was pointing out are clear so that trash or trash cans don't get put on top of the grates um for those basement window wells. Um, how often should fire drills be held? Once a month. What? This is also sort of a trick question. As much as needed. <laughs> um, the standard only says regularly. Fire drill, fire exit drills must be held regularly. So. so. Every ten <laughs> I know. That's one of the things they always look at when they come when the, our state person comes to do our annual inspection. Is they want to see how often we're doing the fire drills, but they. We just have to have regular documentation. It's not like, you know, they want us to have a policy about how often we do them, but as long as they're regular. Oh, no, our policy okay. is once a month. Our policy is once a month, yes. There's a lot of like. You can have a point for that. I can? Yeah. Excellent. Federal and state regulations that allow you to do your thing as long as you can justify the reasoning mm -hmm. behind it. So yep, that's, that's if true. If it's one person in an office, regularly for you is every 10 years because you know what you're doing but then you just have to be able to explain your scenario and why this is okay with you. Mm -hmm. When and how should fire drills be conducted? Um, abruptly. <laughs> and when and how? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. All yes. 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 All like today. Like today. Yeah, that was good. Did you say safely? That was abrupt. Yeah. That was abrupt. <laughs> I'll give you a point for that, Caleb. <laughs> I came earlier. It should have been a fire drill. Um, so. Today there was? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, so they need to be held at unexpected times and under varying conditions to simulate oh, the okay. conditions of an actual fire. So abruptly could be an <laughs> unexpected time. Um, and they should be done like at different times of the day. What about like 3 a.m. Um, is that a good time? That is a good time. Is it really? Yeah, it is a good time. The teens do not agree with me, but. <laughs> <laughs> that is a good time to do that. Um, and then drills must emphasize orderly evacuation under proper discipline rather than speed. Running and horseplay shall not be permitted. Oh, I forgot a couple things. Um, oh, no, not really. Just as we have to keep record of our fire drills, which we do. Okay. Who can drive teens? Most people who want to qualify are the training judges. Who have been sure. Yeah. Have a valid driver's okay. license. Insurance. Insurance. Yeah, yeah. We'll give you all a point for that. Um, although there. Are <laughs> like that you what? Didn't you say like hours? <laughs> yes. That's you? yeah. That's actually our policy. Oh. So there. Um, their rule is just any staff member or other person acting on behalf of the shelter who is safe to operate a vehicle, who has been properly licensed. So we just have additional requirements to that. Which are, which are um, some additional training and then showing a motor vehicle record. So we uh, ask for a motor vehicle record for your file. Um, let's see, okay. What is the rule about confidentiality? And what are the exceptions? So let's first define like what what our rule is about confidentiality. No disclosing a team's location to anyone who has not like received permission for that. Like, mm -hmm. um, what? I just know that because we answer the phones. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So we don't disclose team's location. No private information. Right. Um, we actually really don't disclose any information to any unauthorized persons. <clears throat> um, so anything learned about the youth or their families has to be kept confidential um, with the following exceptions. So when uh, are there exceptions to the confidentiality rule? Is a safety issue if um, I'm at risk or, yeah. Um, Yes. Can you define like what kind of safety issue or risk? Teen is 
suicidal and someone called Hong Kong Line about it, or a team that's threatening to harm another teen or themselves. Um, and yes. that's like the life, life, uh, life, life situation. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes, that is correct. Um, so in medical emergencies, and then only when the assistance and or expertise is required of that unauthorized person. Um, and if a youth is um, attempting to harm himself or herself or others. Um, when are other exceptions to confidentiality? In um, between um, other staff. So if a teen has told you something that um, you think is pertinent for another staff to know, you can disclose that information. From what I understand. Abuse. Yeah, so like need to know. Yes. Need to know type What about a search warrant? Um, a search warrant would, yeah, that would go above our heads. So, um, but we, I don't think we have to disclose anything because they find out what they need to, I think. I'll have to clarify that though. I'm not certain about that. Abuse or any like domestic issues that have yes. happened in the past or current? Yes, that is correct. That's another one. Mandatory reporting of child abuse as required by law. So in those cases, we have to just close um, certain information about the, the youth. And with that, do you call the number immediately, not speak to your supervisor? Or do you speak to your supervisor, then call the phone number? Um, generally, call first. Okay. Um, yes, call first, because mandated reporting is uh, an individual responsibility. And so you would still want to report to your supervisor or to the on-call person to make sure that we're taking good care of the teen. Um, but the person who receives the in information should be the one to report it. Um, there are a couple of other things. So. Um, to the youth, his or her parents or guardians and their respective legal counsel. So in like legal situations or if a court has jurisdiction over the youth um, and is like requiring that information. And if, oh, if the parent or guardian or the youth themselves, if they're over 18, have given voluntary written consent. So uh, we call those the, like a release of information. We have them sign a release of information if we need to share information with a doctor or somebody. Um, and then that's it. So other than that, abuse records can only be released upon the written consent of the youth or their parent or guardian. All right, what is the house's confidentiality policy regarding the door and the phone? The youth cannot answer the door phone, and staff must answer the door phone. Um, and youth can use the phone if they pass that. Sure, yes, that is correct. Oh, Teens no. may not answer the door or the nice. phone. <laughs> and we as staff do not disclose info about teens via the door or the phone. Anybody who's calling or asking about a teen at the door. Where can emergency info about teens be found? In the binder. Yes, where in the binder? Their first page. Yes, the first page of the intake is copied and put in the binder um, for that has their emergency contact info, birth date, medications, allergies, should you have to call 911 um, and have emergency personnel come to the house. Um, you don't have to go digging through files or something in order to find that. Um, so for that reason, it's very important that the binder stay confidential and none of that information be transferred to other youth or to other people, um, other staff without uh, a need to know. All right, um, we'll spend a few minutes on critical incident reports. So um, the state of Colorado requires us to report certain categories of incidents as called critical incident reports. And so we have to fill out um, a form in an online database uh, within 24 hours of that incident happening. So, um, and there are several categories, quite a few categories actually, of things that we have to report. So. Um, there are 11 items, 11 categories, so I'll give a point for each category named and then I'll read like the definition around those. Like uh, emergency care, so if the ambulance just passed, report that. Yep, that's one. Well, um, I'm sorry, what was it? Uh, emergency medical care, so if an ambulance like, shows up to the house and um, I have to go to ER or like, okay. okay. Yep. If there's a physical fight between residents? Yes, um, assault, any assault, let me read the 
one on that, um, by a child upon a child. And for our purposes, child means anyone in our care, so age 13 to 20. Um, child upon child, child upon staff member, or staff member upon a child, which results in a report to law enforcement. Only oh, which one. results in a report? Uh, it says, do not report if there is only law enforcement agency contact and none of the above actions occur. Yeah. The above actions meaning report if a law enforcement agency files charges, issues a summons or citation to a child, and or the child is arrested while child has an open placement at the... It calls us the foster home, but we're the facility to include while the child is on or off grounds. So, yeah, I guess their their wording is pretty specific, and the the bar is pretty high for that. Any physical or sexual abuse? Yes, any report of um, physical or sexual abuse, any type of abuse, really, that results in um, a report to the child protection hotline, which any report should. If they miss some kind of, if like if they miss their probation or their court date, like um, the legal thing. Close. Um, if they are charged with something while they're in our care. So if they are like arrested while they're in our care for like a, a new charge, not like a pre-existing charge is my understanding. Um, yeah, if they're arrested. We don't have to report if there's only law enforcement agency contact and there's no charges issued, no um, summons or citation, and no arrest made. If there's some kind of natural disaster that forces evacuation? Yes. That one. That one would count as a ma any major threat to the security of a facility, including but not limited to a threat to kidnap a child, riots, bomb threats, hostage situations, use of a weapon, or drive-by shootings. None of those are natural disasters, but yeah, like I'm pretty sure we have, we have to report those too. I think that's on here somewhere. Well, is that different? Did that say just any threat? Because is there a difference between the lockdown and then an evacuation? Um, yes. A lockdown... Like, is there a difference? I think it depends on whether one of these things happens or not. What what type of major threat there was. There's still seven left, everybody. <laughs> Any, like, self-harm suicidal attempts? Mm -hmm. Yep, the suicide attempt is another one. Another one. What about, like, ingestion of narcotics or, like, poison control type stuff? Um, yes, that is a good point. So if it's, yeah, that would probably require emergency medical care, so it would fall under that category. Um, but I'm glad you brought that up because um, medication errors that reach a level three threshold, so there's four uh, categories of medication errors, so no, one and two don't meet threshold for uh, a critical incident report, but a three or a four does. And so um, a category three is like in uh, incorrectly administered medication, like the youth gets the wrong medication or too much medication or medication outside of the window that they should receive it and it results in like an adverse reaction. So they have some type of reaction like uh, rapid breathing or increased heart rate um, that, that they have to have medical attention for. And then a uh, level four is uh, death. Mm -hmm. So. Um, what about like if they're unaccounted for, if they leave and no one can find them for an amount of time? That is not, <clears throat> unless we have reason to believe that they're in very serious danger. <clears throat> in which case we would, you know, get law enforcement involved. And even then, unless it was able to be verified that the that they were in danger or in emergency medical care or something like that, then we wouldn't need to report. What about drugs on <clears throat> premises? That is not any like natural death on those yeah. Yep. Death. death. Period. Yeah. <laughs> death. Yep. Sad to say. Hope that never happens. But that would definitely be a critical. Is that a different report. category from the suicide? No. No. Um, suicide. We have to report for an attempt. Oh. So uh, an attempted suicide would be a report. And then, uh, of course, if it resulted in death, that would be a report. Okay. I think there's still four left. 
<laughs> You're, I'm not even keeping track. I'm counting. <laughs> um, another one is a mandatory reportable illness um, as defined by the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment. Oh, like an like epidemic thing? thing like yeah. You have, mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, only Which if it requires that. emergency medical attention. Only so, if yeah, I know the, the, uh, <laughs> the threshold is pretty high for They're these. Like, so and you can have Zika all you so want. if they get what are the there's I have the list here too. If they get um, hepatitis A, but they don't have to be hospitalized for it, and they get over it, then I guess we don't have to report it. the The list here is pretty severe. It's like. Um, animal bites by dogs, cats, bats, skunks, or I'm not going to read all these. Yeah, these. Read you you read <laughs> yeah. Um, botulism, so different types of food poisoning, um, group outbreaks. So if a whole bunch of people break out, like have the same illness, um, like foodborne, foodborne or waterborne illness, um, human rabies, measles, pertussis. Rubella, SARS, Plague, smallpox, SARS. tuberculosis. Um, so those are 24-hour reportables. I didn't read the whole list, but there are a few I don't even know how to pronounce. Um, what about like weapons on property oh. that that has like caused harm? But that would be a threat. That would be. Um, yeah, that would probably count as a major threat. So we got the mandatory reportable illness. Oh, any fire that would. Wow. Um, yeah, any Just fire that's responded to by a okay. local fire department. Um, we got major threat. Oh, you know what, Lindsay? You're, uh, you're right. I'll give you a point for that one. So not necessarily having drugs on premises, but um, a drug or alcohol related incident involving a staff member or a child that requires outside medical or emergency response. So it does have that tag attached to it. And we got assault, we got suicide attempt. Um, the last one that we haven't named is um, felony theft or destruction of property oh, by a child oh. while in placement for which law enforcement is notified. So it's just, if you have to call 911, you have to report it. Yes, good rule of thumb. <clears throat> so again, like I don't expect anybody to have these memorized, um, but just keep those in the back of your mind for if, if something happens that you call um, on call for or something that seems like a serious incident. Um, document everything as well as you can from the time that, it, that you found out about it or the time that it happened to what you did about it, who you notified when, because um, all of those details have to go into the reports. Um, and there's a, a green laminated sheet in the binder that says like reasons to call on call um, or circumstances which necessitate calling the on-call supervisor and a lot of those things, not all of them, um, but many of them would be reported as critical incidents. So like a fire in the building for which we had to call um, 911 or like an assault of a teen against another teen. So, <laughs> All right. Um, who should you call? Oh, this is going to be easy. Who should you call if a critical incident report occurs on your shift? Police. Call and call. Okay. Yeah, police. Yes, police. Most likely. Nine one one. Sounds like it's a good rule of thumb. But also, notify. On call. On call. Yes, on call. If you call 911, I definitely want to know about that. Or I want the on-call person to know so that we can get another person in there to help. Um, all right, name three items that teens may not have in the house. Contraband items. Cigarettes, lighters, oh, nice. weapons. Cigarettes, lighters, weapons. So a point for Brandt. I'll give a point to someone who can name three other things. No polish, no polish remover. Um, Wait, nail polish? We oh, had nail polish. Air spray, aerosol cans. Yeah. Okay, so we point to Maddie. aerosol cans. Yep, those they things be should up. be locked up. There are things that they can use but can't have out, mm -hmm. and nail polish oh, is one of them. Oh, okay. okay. Why is that? Mm -hmm. that uh, the fumes. No. Oh, mm -hmm. rated R movies. movies. Yeah, rated R movies. Just can you name two other things? <laughs> um, oh, razor blade. Uh, Cleaners? Chemicals? Chemical cleaners? Um, yeah, I'll give that one to you. Um, that's not something that we typically find in teens' backpacks, but if they did have cleaning supplies in their backpacks, those would be things that we'd have to confiscate. Oh, tweezers. 
Um, yeah, tweezers, sharp objects, things that could be used as a weapon. Wrote that would a nail file count as well? I generally that? confiscate nail files. <laughs> what? Really? Yeah, like the, well, nail clippers, not like the cardboard ones, but nail clippers that have the, you know, sharp, the sharp, uh, yeah. sort of you sharp take edge. Those? I do, yeah. I do. I do too. <laughs> Um, let's see, so I think we got most of these on here. I'm just, uh, any drugs or drug paraphernalia, I think you guys probably said that, but watch out for things like um, pipes or bongs. Um, also, like a youth had recently a little tiny canister with like little uh, weed seeds in there, like marijuana seeds in there. So that's contraband to like, any type of, who knows, <laughs> maybe just to show off to friends. Um, you know, when we're starting to see at the schools, they have, um, they're mixing oil in Vaseline, like marijuana oil. Oh, okay. They're calling it yeah. like that. No. Oh. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, watch out for Vaseline. <laughs> yeah. Check Vaseline. Um, aerosol containers, um, prescription meds or over-the-counter meds, anything containing alcohol, like mouthwash or perfume. I can't think of anything else that might have alcohol in it. Again, a perfume? They cannot have it on them. So just all that stuff has to be in their hygiene box. Yep. Um, except like there are certain things that we wouldn't even allow in the building, like we would confiscate right away. So any of the drug related things, okay. um, even lighters, you know, we should be confiscating lighters. And hygiene That's items, it. just make sure to remind them that um, like if that's something that they're taking the in and out of their backpack. Deodorant. Um, is not on the list, but I think those should be locked up too. Those should be in their hygiene boxes. Pretty much any hygiene item has to be locked up in their boxes mm. for a risk of consumption. Uh, football bag has deodorant. Yeah, Sydney had deodorant in her bag. Mm. Yeah. Oh, please don't use um, teen names. I forgot to mention that at the beginning of the training. Um, okay. Da, 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 da. My next question is name eye hygiene items that must be kept locked up, but we got them all. It's basically all of them. Um, razors, of course. Those are sharp objects, too. Uh, I had another question about one of these. Are they in the office or are they in their hygiene box? In their hygiene boxes. They are. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you want to check the hygiene box before you check it out to the youth. So lift the lid, make sure you see like if the youth has one or two razors in there, kind of eyeball what's in there and then check it again when they give it back to you. What about mirrors? Mirrors? No. We have allowed them to have mirrors. Yeah. Okay, I guess that was it about hygiene stuff. Um, true or false? Teens are allowed to use kitchen knives. False. Yes. True. 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 Yes, that well, is true. Um, unlocked. Yeah. Yeah. We allow the teens to use knives, but under supervision. So otherwise, knives must always be kept locked up. Um, true or false? Knives can go through the dishwasher. False. 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 Why? Because then they're unsupervised. Yes. Yep, that is the reason. Um, lack of supervision. You walk away from the dishwasher, somebody wants to hurt somebody, they yank open the dishwasher, grab a knife. Um, so knives have to be washed and sanitized by hand and put away, locked in the sink cabinet. Um, in which case, might you not let a teen use a knife? If they're agitated. Yes, if they're agitated, escalated, Maybe if they uh, like self-harm ideas that have gone past, maybe it, it's a safety pin not to allow sharp hunt objects. Yeah, mm -hmm. good, good idea. So um, read the binder when you come in for your shift because if a teen has a safety plan with something like that, um, you wouldn't necessarily know that um, unless you, you read it on their safety plan. So that would be definitely a reason to not let a teen use a knife if they have self-harm tendencies. Other cases, like maybe if a teen has made a recent threat against another teen or um, yeah, they're escalated for some reason or another. Or if they're trying to practice juggling. <laughs> or if they're trying to practice juggling. Sounds like a funny question, but um, you would be surprised at 
things like that teens do. There was one incident where um, somebody was like, we had a, a dearth of donated vegetables one summer um, and there were a lot of squash and so a youth was like throwing squash in the air and trying to like <laughs> chop them with a knife as they were in the air. So not super safe. Works in cartoons. <laughs> yeah. What? Works in cartoons. Yeah, it does. Yeah. Why isn't real life a cartoon? I don't know. Okay. Um, I think that's it really. We've gone through that a lot quicker than I thought we would so it's probably not a bad thing. So do you guys have any questions about regulations or universal precautions? Wait, that's the end of, end of training? I yeah, to that is it. Do <laughs> you feel well reviewed? Oh, that's a great question. So one fire extinguisher is in the kitchen right at the entrance. It's like not hanging on the wall because it won't stay on that hook. It's fallen many times and broken the little tile that's yeah. right there. So it is just sitting at the base of the of the counter. Um, the one at the the upstairs level is like right outside of Patty's office, mounted on the wall in the hallway. And then the basement one is also like right at the base of the stairs. Um, so if you just look to your right when you come to the bottom of the stairs, it's mounted on the wall. I can't remember if it's like this wall next to the bedroom door or if it's this wall next to the office door. I think it's this one next to the office door, but it's right there in that corner. And those are serviced annually. They just come and check them for us automatically. Did you mention we were getting um, gloves for um, safety and cleaning purposes? Possibly? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yep. I bought um, two boxes of 100 each. So we'll have one under the sink and one um, in the in that corner underneath the whiteboard okay. in the kitchen. So right. easy use for cleaning or if you have to administer first aid to somebody. Okay. All right, you guys feel pretty well reviewed? Mm -hmm. One more thing about the um, first aid box. My understanding is that we enable teenagers to pick what they need from that, but that we don't actually do the first aid ourselves. Um, I think that depends on the situation because we are all, you know, CPR first aid certified. So um, if the youth is unable to administer first aid themselves, then we should be the ones to like wrap the arm or put on the bandage or something. But if they're if they're capable, they certainly can do it themselves. We could just provide them access. Anything else? All right. Thank you for attending. Thank Thanks, you, Sarah. Sarah.